Hey, Jeremy Bourne with Gray Matter here. Thanks for joining us today. It's really good to see everybody joining in. Um, for those of you who are jo joining in early, we're just going to go over a few quick things and then we'll get to our main presenter today, Steve Poblaski from GE Digital. Steve, good to see you today. Good to see you, Jeremy. Yeah, so just a couple of housekeeping items as we get started here at the top of the hour. Today's presentation is Managing OT Data in the Cloud, featuring Steve, as I mentioned. Um, and if you check out greatmattersystems.com, you can find out about events that we do just like this one every month. Um, we call it Empower Up Live. It comes from Gray Matters motto, transforming operations, empowering people. That's where we get Empower Up from. And, you know, we cover topics like this one every month, and it's really to your benefit to check those up and to uh, sign up for them whenever they come up. We also do GE certified training classes. We do them in person and online, and they cover topics like GEI Fix, HMI, SCADA, Operations Hub Fundamentals, Historian Fundamentals. Um, we have, I think, one last class starting December 12th. Uh, there could be one or two seats available for that, but then we have a new crop coming up uh, in January. So check us out there at the uh, site that you see at the bottom of the screen, greatmattersystems.com slash training. You can find out more and sign up for those. Uh, other couple of reminders today, please ask questions during the presentation. We are live, so we have the opportunity to get those questions to Steve. I can ask them and we can get through some of that stuff um, towards the end of today's presentation. We have the hour, but we probably won't use all of it. But uh, if we have a lot of questions, then we will. And then also same goes for the folks who are watching this on demand after the live date. If you have questions or something that piques your interest, let us know about it. Um, we can uh, get into it with Steve and dig deeper into whatever it is that you're interested in. So do make use of the uh, questions and comments during today's presentation. So uh, I think with that, I'd like to bring Steve in. And uh, Steve, welcome. Good to see you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, glad to be here. Glad to uh, you know share sort of my perspectives with uh, with your audience. And uh, and thanks to the audience for for taking the time today. I hope. Uh, I hope this is a valuable uh, use of your time. Um, a little bit. Well, let's go back. Go back one slide. Just I'll tell a little bit about myself. So, um, I've been in the industrial space, uh, working for GE for 36 years now. I was around at the very beginning of HMI SCADA um, back in the in the late 80s, um, as we as we really at that point started helping customers, you know, connect to their equipment and provide. Um, provide information to their operators to help them, you know, run their facilities. So it's a long journey, um, and I'm really excited about uh, about you know the new technology that's enabling our customers to, you know, create additional value uh, from the data coming from their equipment. And that's really what today's today's talk is going to be about. Yeah. So let's let's move ahead, Jeremy. You know, from as as we engage with customers right what we are finding is the the traditional um, the traditional applications that we provide um, obviously continue to to play a role in in our in our customers operations helping them um, helping them you know control their processes better um, working, you know, our, with our MES to, uh, to to manage efficiency and quality uh, of of the products that, that are being produced, uh, leveraging Historian, bring all of that data together um, in you know in visualization tools like our our Operations Hub, which will allow customers to to build apps that um, that that allow them to. Um, really understand uh, the whole the, the operator to understand sort of the whole picture by bringing HMI SCADA data, MES data, historical trend data together in a single display, um, and, and all of this is driven by by data. But what can be done within the factory or the plant, right, has has limits. And and today, what we're finding is many of our customers have embarked on. Uh, on strategies on how do they leverage analytic technology, often coming you know from the cloud, and so to be able to leverage those technologies, you've got to be able to to get that data um, uh, up to the cloud uh, that will allow you to leverage those tools, whether it be at a single plant level or often at an enterprise level. 
you know, but that's challenging, right? You know, we think about our plants today, right? And, you know, most of most plants that I've been in, right, have have been have been built up over 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 80 years, right? With lots of different types of equipment, lots of different um, ability to collect data from them. Um, and so, and, and even when we've got similar machines or similar machine types within the facilities, you've got different brands, you've got, you've got different vintages. And so really one of the big challenges in manufacturing is the collection of uh, heterogeneous data at scale. You know, we think about industrial internet technologies and, and, you know, if, if, all you, if all you had to monitor was temperature and vibration off of pumps, that's a relatively, um, a relatively easy solve now. I happen to be out at Las Vegas this week. I'm at uh, AWS's reInvent. You know, they've got a solution called Monotron, which will, you know, you can connect a device to your gearbox or your pump or your, your motor and collect up vibration and temperature data into the, into their solution because it's all and all of the data is is common um, but when you've got a wide variety of data right there, there's there's unique challenges the good thing is right we often are collecting that data into the SCADA system into the MES potentially have added sensors uh, onto the equipment um, you know and you know co- can can get access to data the real question is now, how do you get it up efficiently and get it to the cloud and, and sort of cross that that network boundary and that sort of OT format of data and expose that data in the IT oriented um, structures that are required to leverage more cloud based or IT oriented tools. You know, and so you know, so that's really the that's really the the challenge is is you know bridging these functional silos to create a unified view of the data, right? Often with asset context, especially if you're going to be using data across across an enterprise, right? You know, adding that asset context to data will become uh, more and more important uh, as as we look to solve these problems at at enterprise scale. What's interesting, and so this this is a uh, this is some data that we've uh, that we've collected up from discussions with analysts and and through our experience um, working with uh, with cloud providers. Um, first, I think all of us recognize that um, that COVID um, presented an opportunity and a forcing function for a change in company policies with respect to um, IT infrastructure, and whether that be you know causing causing uh, companies to be much more accepting of remote monitoring and control of their processes to leveraging cloud-based infrastructure because frankly nobody wanted to have IT people in the data center right because that was that that created a business risk and so there's there's been a change um, we see customers of all sizes, you know, signing volume purchase agreements with the cloud providers, right? Well, now what does that mean? That means, well, they want to, they want to start using applications that help them consume their volume commitments. Um, The cloud-based AI and ML-based workloads for optimization uh, of, of what's going on in our plants need access to OT data, but that's not easy. And we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, why that's not been easy. Um, a couple of a uh, couple of notes here from uh, from the industry analyst Gartner right, on the on changes that have occurred over the last couple of years. So Gartner does a, every five years they do a survey of operational leaders and IT leaders um, on the decision um, decision ownership of level three level four systems uh, uh, historians and and MES in particular. And what's very interesting is the most recent survey, which I think is about two years old now, for the very first time, both the operations leadership and IT leadership indicated that IT had the primary ownership of the decision-making process. 
So very interesting in terms of shifting, uh, shifting control. Um, and, and I think largely that's driven because IT, uh, this, this is IT infrastructure. We're, you know, we're talking about cloud, we're talking about tool sets. Um, and so what that means is, you know, they, uh, the IT organization is, is, is sort of pushing down into the organization its its influence because what they are they're tasked with helping deliver business outcomes and so the accessibility of data and the integration of systems is important to them um, second point from gartner is we talk to gartner analysts most customers today who are doing um, analyst inquiries asking for recommendations regarding mes solutions from their analysts uh, most customers today are asking about cloud-based deployments. And so that, that, that's, you know, very interesting. And, and frankly, it's borne out by our experience. Many of our customers or, or potential customers that we're dealing with um, are, are looking for how do they use cloud-based infrastructure or how do they, uh, or do we offer a SaaS-based offering uh, because they don't want to be running on, infrastructure that they're managing. Not always, but uh, but for a large percentage of, of the applications. And then lastly, from ARC, uh, the last uh, the last report that we had, uh, that we purchased, uh, when, when you dug into the report, the historian market uh, report um, showed that the overall market for historians were growing six and a half percent. But when you looked at deployments on private cloud, those were growing 16%. And so really very interesting shift there in terms of customers recognizing that they they don't necessarily want to be running that technology on-prem. So they're either running on infrastructure as a service, and we'll talk a little bit about why that's an, an issue, um, but or they're looking for, you know, cloud native, which which we'll, uh, we'll get to in a bit. You know, so... So look, as, as as the leader of uh, of the product platform for GE Digital and the and the and the product manager for our historian over the last four years, right? I've talked to many many customers about uh, you know historian technology and what the outcomes that they're trying to get uh, from their data across multiple sites. So, you know, how much power does it? take to produce the same product at these two plants? How much chemicals does it take per million gallons uh, to process water at these two, you know, at these two water treatment plants? Um, you know, what, which plant you, is most efficient in terms of the use of raw materials? Why, why is that the case? Why are the other plants less efficient, right? How do we, you know, why is quality more consistent at one plant versus another? So these are the kinds of questions customers are trying to solve today, right? Which is really understand their 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 sort of best in class across their enterprise, and then help drive the rest of the enterprise, you know, to meet that that best in class. Um, this is really a, a critical way for them to drive uh, to drive uh, optimization of whatever they're trying to drive, whether that be uh, trying to meet sustainability goals, whether that be trying to you know, improve quality and reduce cost and efficiency, whatever it may be, right? One of the key ways is is understand where where do you do it best, and then how do you bring the rest of the organization up to that level? Steve, are these questions that customers bring to the table like early on? Or are they kind of discoveries that come along the way? Um, so it's a great question, and it's a bit hard for me because, you know, many of the customers I talk to are, are customers that we've done business with a long time, mm -hmm. um, but often they may be new engagements, right? I, I specifically remember the conversation that I was having happened to be a system integrator who was working with a uh, municipality that had two water treatment plants, and that that question there about water treatment um that was what he was trying to, to to figure out. So he was bringing bringing the the data together from those two water treatment plants, trying to understand the you know the power, the chemical, and the labor costs per million gallons at those two plants to try to help that municipality understand you know what their 
um, what their best in class was, and then how do they improve the other plant to, to meet that. So fundamentally, cu customers today are always looking to do optimization of something. You know, we live in a, a world where, it, you know, year on year productivity um, is critical. And for, our, for, you know, for in many cases for companies to, to continue to thrive, if not just to survive. And so there's always, uh, there's always an opportunity for improvement. It's just what, what, what opportunity or, or what particular goal um, a, a given customer is chasing at any given time might change. Yeah, each one of those seems like uh, it could definitely be a real world example and either something that you kind of imagine when you're starting a project or one that you come to later on. So those are great examples. Yeah. Yeah, I, many of these are actual. You know, you <laughs> yeah. know change, change, change names to uh, to you know to protect the protect the innocent. But right. uh, many of these come from um, actual conversations I've had with customers over the past couple of years. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Look, and then as we talk to the IT folks, right, the IT organizations, they're playing a stronger role, and especially when you start to think about enterprise level, right? Perhaps within a plant, perhaps operations is is still you know, largely making the decision. But as you talk about enterprise scale, cross plants, right? Now IT really starts to play a bigger role. And, you know, so so we get this feedback, right? We get, you know, projects are delayed because it takes forever to get servers. Um, there are issues with either, either corporate policy issues. They don't want to send their process data uh, to, you know, to a, another software supplier, you know, run, storing it in the cloud is one thing in an environment that they control, but sending it off to a third party that's a hosted solution, you know, has problems. Often they have time to live problems because they're not architected for cost effective long term storage. And so they'll say, well, you can store your data here for two years or three years, but then it's got to go somewhere else. Um, look, we live in the industrial space. If we're storing data, uh, like all of us want to store it for 10 years, right? Because we want to have that data. If there's some, if we have to go back in time and look at that data because there's some quality issue. If we're, if we find we, you know, we can build a new, a new uh, AI or ML based model. We want to have the data to train it, right? So, you know, being able to store data for two years or three years is not satisfactory. Um, in many cases, giving up ownership of data or control of data, maybe not ownership, but but handing your data over to someone else to store for you, you know, may, uh, may be a, sort of going against your grain. Um, you may also have need, right, for data from sort of the operational user who needs it as, as a historian, but also expose it to IT-based tools. So how do you, how do you, how do we enable that um, easily? Um, we're also see from our uh, from from our from IT that they're much more um, opex oriented, right? They're now paying for their infrastructure via opex via cloud. All of the services that they're paying on the cloud are opex, and so they're looking for both opex, but also often true consumption based pricing. They really only want to pay for what they're actually consuming. Um, so. You know, consumption-based pricing is becoming important in this market, and then depending on the industry, right? We we have uh, we have customers that um, if they they want to use cloud because they want to take uh, cost out, and that's another another element here. But you know, they need uh, they need GovCloud because they need to they need to have a lockdown of who has access, and it has to only certain services will be allowed to be used. So. Um, so designing a, a solution to, to run in that environment was important to some some subset of our customers. You know, if we look at the if we look at the choices that customers have had up until now, um, there's not really been great choices that allowed them to both bring data up across the OT data across the enterprise um, at at scale. Right. The, you could run and we have customers doing this today. Right. You could run a, a, a traditional historian on infrastructure as a service. So you're now off of on prem infrastructure, which solves some goals. But but frankly, you're it's not um, it's not necessarily cost effective. 
um, especially for high volume applications. Cloud IO is different than on-prem IO, all right? You can buy an SSD, uh, you know, terabyte, a five terabyte or whatever drive on-prem and get really high performance to get similar performance for a very large application in the cloud is really expensive, um, uh, at least for some cloud suppliers. Um, they also, um, you know, so you also don't gain any efficiencies in terms of management of the application. It's still a Windows server that needs maintained. It's still, you know, you've got to take it down to do software updates, whatever. So you're not really gaining much in terms of efficiency. So, um, so running a historian on infrastructure as a service is an option, but it doesn't really solve for all the needs. It doesn't, you know, you could have the data up there. You still haven't solved the, how are you going to make that data accessible to analytic tools that are running, you know, natively in the cloud. Um, you've got hosted industrial solutions, and I apologize for the, you know, the, 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 the text here, but, you know, hope there are hosted solutions out there. Um, again, those come with problems like time to live problems, po company policy problems in terms of sending their data elsewhere, um, may be challenging to integrate data, right? You have to deal with security issues in terms of how are you going to create a connection from your data lake or your analytic tool set in your private cloud to that vendor's uh, inter uh, vendor solution. So it just creates challenges. And then lastly, the cloud providers do offer time series applications. The problem is they're designed for typical cloud use cases, which are typically looking at very high volumes of data over very short time periods, i.e. cloud application metrics. You know, what, you know, how many, how many pages is somebody looking at Facebook? Right or, or Salesforce or, or some other application, they're not this, they're not cost effective for the long term data storage that the uh, that the industrial customer uses. Um, plus, often they're just services. You've got to build. How are you going to do the data collection? How are you going to manage who has access? How are you going to do configuration? Right, they're just a time series. They're not a, they're not a historian in in what you know our industrial customers think of when you when you say a historian right yes a historian collects and stores data but it has standard ways of querying it maybe you want to use excel to query the data it has how robust data collection so all the things that go into a historian don't actually show up in a time series solution in most of the cloud based applications and so we looked at the needs that the market was sharing you know, we looked at the what were the solutions on in the market and found there really weren't any really great solutions. And so that's what's led us to, uh, you know, to, you know, where we're going to where we're going to go next. Right. So this is just that summary. Right. So as we talked to customers, they were looking for, you know, hybrid solutions, cloud native to that that had a cloud native component that allowed them to easily. And, and reduce the cost of deployment of this kind of technology, yet maintain inter interoperability and, uh, and and allow for users in the shop floor to interact with the data and the, using the tools they're used to, but provide that ability to, to deliver um, the capability of collecting data from across the enterprise at mass scale while letting the customer manage the, the and continue to own that data and simplifying the uh, the integration with the IT tool sets that they want to use, whether that's Power BI or some AI and ML based workload, right? Out of you know they they want that to be simple. And so, and when Jeremy, let's we'll, let's just move on to the next slide, right? So you know, so this is really what we're what we've solved, and and as I said, right, what an industrial historian is really responsible for robust connection to uh, assets collection of that data, storage of that data, and then exposing that data uh, to other applications for use cases like analysis, predictions, and optimizations, right? So that, if I think if we look at that sort of yellow arc there, that's that's the core of what, uh, of what customers think of when we think about an industrial historian. And so what we've now done, and you can move forward, Jeremy, is, is you know, help, help solve that problem across the enterprise 
And so as we as we do talk to customers, right, we do recognize that there are for many applications still a need for local high speed, um, uh, uh, robust data, uh, high speed historians. Um, and so, you know, there are, we have customers today that are looking at making that decision. Do I need to deploy on-prem uh, for very high speed applications? Cause I don't want to send all of that data to the cloud. Or do I want to uh, do I want to just go ahead and, and deploy fully, uh, you know, deploy fully in the cloud, right? So we give we as as we think about solving this problem, we think about leveraging existing infrastructure. We think about giving customers choice of where they deploy, and we think about yet still providing um, a true historian that's cloud based that bridges that OT to IT gap that help them uh, with the enterprise uh, analysis that they're that they're looking to do. And so we introduced earlier this year, you know, Prophecy Historian for Cloud. Um, and there are a couple of key things here that um, that we built, right? So same, uh, um, same APIs, zero integration effort. If you're already a Prophecy user, great, but we still maintain you know, many of the interfaces so that we provide interoperability of the historian just happens to be a different endpoint. Customer wants to use Excel to query the data. It doesn't matter if it's on-prem or in the cloud. It's just a different endpoint, just as an example. Um, we maintain all of the robust protocols that uh, support that we've had. So it really doesn't matter what your source of data. It could be machine tools via MT Connect. It could be smart sensors over MQTT. It could be directly out of PLCs or DCSs uh, via proprietary protocols or frankly Modbus or OPC DA or UA. Um, it could be relational databases uh, through ODBC, it could be other third-party historians. Um, it, you know, we have connectivity to all of that infrastructure. So for those customers that have a variety of on-prem infrastructure in the plants, Right, we give them one common way to connect um, and, and bring all of that data into a single normalized uh, time series. But from an IT perspective, it's deployed and managed through cloud-based technologies. We use Kubernetes, it's auto-scaling, there's zero downtime upgrades. And, and when you think about the importance of doing data collection, not having to wait for downtime, not having to have an IT person on the weekends to do uh, um, server updates for the operating system or application version updates, right? Big benefit to the organization in terms of availability of data and a reduction in IT cost. Um, you know, we're working towards um, data replication and actually distributing the application across multiple geographic zones. So customers that have say European and North American plants you know, the local users will will be able to get the data from the local data center, um, but with auto failover across geographic zones. So again, you know, high reliability uh, across uh, across the organization because this is critical data. Um, we're just releasing the capability to do scheduled export to Parquet, um, and, and and well, that. You may not know what that means. Parquet files are an industry standard file format. They're often used in uh, in big data applications. But what that really means is it's super simple to now take the OT data and pipe it into the data lake to run analytics against it, to connect Tableau or Power BI, right? All of those IT oriented applications, it's very simple. To, to deal with the data in this standard format. The other thing that we do is, um, you know, we make it easy for customers if they're making the choice to move, you know, we make it easy to do that. Um, there's no sort of streaming all of your legacy gigabytes or terabytes of data, right? Especially on the Amazon environment, you know, they have physical devices. You can basically do file copies of your historical data, ship it off to Amazon, they'll load it into your file space. So very low, uh, low effort to migrate uh, years of data uh, from on-prem to the cloud. And we've done that at the same time, all with a new new commercial model. So I talked before about uh, consumption-based um, pricing. 
you know, we've broken the sort of mold on, on the way historians are, are, are purchased you know, as we move to the cloud and offer a true consumption-based pricing based on, you know, the numbers of samples being stored or queried. Um, and it becomes much more cost effective. Uh, there's effectively no upfront cost. Uh, there's no license price upfront. You're just, we've made it really inexpensive to store data. Because of the way we've architected the solution, it's very low cost from an infrastructure perspective to run. And, and so really what we've done here is align the, the cost to, for you as a user with the value, which is you're going to pay as you're doing queries or reports or, or analysis on the data. Um, you're paying almost nothing uh, to store the data, no matter how much you're storing. Next slide, please. So this this happens to be two screenshots out of one of our demo systems, and uh, it really shows that it took minutes to actually configure the what what um, tags out of the system did we want to export to Parquet. Once that process was flowing, right, we were able to see the Parquet files in in our Amazon environment, and then you know we could um, we used Athena, uh, which is one of the Amazon tools to um, to expose that data both to QuickSight and to Power BI. So both of these sampled, you know, the building, the, the configuring of the data, exposing it to, um, to the IT infrastructure, and then building these dashboards. This whole process took about 15 minutes to, to get from, I've got data flowing into a historian, how do I expose it to the IT org, uh, tools? And then we built these two different dashboards and two different tool sets, right? And so what that, to me, what that really demonstrated was the power of the, of the sort of integration between the OT layer and the IT layer that, that we're enabling for our customers. Because we could have just as easily been piping this data into, you know, SageMaker or any other, uh, any other uh, uh, AI or ML based tool. Uh, we also have third parties that, uh, again, on the previous slide, I talked about all of our APIs were the same. You know, companies like Seek, who have for years have had a historian on prem uh, high speed interface, uh, Seek's SaaS offering will talk natively to historian in the cloud. And it took zero effort on their behalf because it, we had maintained the, uh, the APIs. Um, and so what that exposes is lots, there's lots of tool sets that can be used. GE has tool sets, and I think I've got a slide here later in the deck, or, you know, around one of those. But our goal here is really to help customers both, you know, collect up that data from across the enterprise into historian type technology in a cost effective way, but then again, expose it to visualization, reporting, or analytic tools where it really helps them solve the business problem that they're going after, right? We have tools that help solve certain business problems. We know that there's lots of other tools that customers are looking to uh, to use. And so our goal here is really to, to cross that OT to IT uh, chasm and, and simplify the that, that whole, how do I get all my OT data from my plants up to the cloud so that I can then use other tools against it. Steve, do you, do you have some examples of roles at a company that you would you would typically see um, someone using, you know, these dashboards right off the bat? Yeah, so I mean these were these were just sort of these were custom dashboards that we built using the standard widgets. I mean ultimately Right. If you think about what people have used for years, you've used, you know, Microsoft Excel at the plant level, you know, to query a historian and, and build reports and build tables and view trends. Right. This to me is the next generation, because what it now does is it allows simple comparatives uh, of data coming from multiple plants. Right. Because you've brought all that data up into a single data store and now you have these cloud based tools that can allow you to. Um, you know, either have the same the same dashboard and you just point to different data sets from different plants or you could be building dashboards. So, if, you know, I think the real question here is, you know, what, as you said, right, what are those use cases? You may have, um, you may have, uh, you know, 
management folks that are that are already running Tableau or Power BI or you know QuickSight dashboards for other parts of their you know managing of, of the of the operation. And so now it's just in the same tools that they're already using. They now have access to the OT data. Um, it could be um, you know we talk to a lot of customers today who are forming um, analytic strategy teams. And so, right there, they're out looking for what are those business problems that we want to solve. We talked to a lot of customers that have, you know, sustainability has become a big, uh, a big initiative across industry, um, even more so in Europe. It's a, you know, we get quite a pull there, and and often customers really are trying to understand, you know, to build, you know, or produce a given product, which they produce in multiple plants. You know, where is it most? energy efficient or water efficient um, to produce. Again, going back to what they're really trying to do is, is meet overall, in this case could be sustainability goals. They need to understand where are they best in class and then look for opportunities for improvement. So um, yeah, so, so to me, this is, this is all about operational efficiency at whatever level in the organization it's just now exposing the tool, the data to, to new sets of tools. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. This happens to be, I, you know, I touched on IT costs. You know, we're working with GD, GE Aviation right now. Um, you know, so just, just from an IT infrastructure perspective, right, they today have um, historians in 32 plants. You know, they're going through um, a, in their, you know, a robust, you um, evaluation of the you know they you know they're they're largely doing business with the government they're they've got to go through a validation uh, process which which is great and they're we're, we're helping them through that um, but they're they the what they've done just from a from an IT infrastructure and then from an IT labor cost you know they expect to reduce infrastructure costs by 20% and reduce their their labor costs by $185,000. And that really comes from, they've got 32 plants. That's 32 Saturdays a year that someone's round robin, shutting down servers because they can't do it during the week. You know, someone, you know, from IT is shutting down a server, doing operating system patching, you know, doing version upgrades, validation, and and bringing the the server back up. Um, You know, they're, the, the, those folks who I've, I've known for many years are really excited to be getting their weekends back, right? And so, you know, that then also, by the way, impacts employee engagement and, and happiness, right? This is a set of folks that now get their weekends back. Um, so uh, just, a, just a ton of benefit just on sort of infrastructure, uh, let alone the creation of additional value that they're going to get by combining. They probably won't because of data um, segregation. They, they'll probably not bring all of the data from all 32 plants into a single historian. Um, they may break that. They will break it up into two or three sort of enterprise scale historians, but um, it does give them that, uh, you know, they still get all the benefit from zero downtime upgrades and, and uh, all, all of the uh, IT infrastructure cost uh, savings. Does that come from like a redundancy security standpoint, having those separate historians for so many sites or? Um, in, in their case, it's really about, um, they've got some plants that do government business and some plants that do non-government business. So the government business plants have to be in GovCloud, which comes with a bit of extra um, burden, right? From a security perspective sure. of who yeah. has access to all that to the you know non-government plants. And so that's really wh- why they're, they're going to take that route. Gotcha. You know, and and then I brought in a, you know, I brought in a slide about um, a solution that we offer called Prophecy Operations Analytics, right? Which is really, this is a cloud-based solution, really helping customers solve um, quality, throughput, energy efficiency, uptime, uh, asset reliability, and asset life-based applications. Um, And so, Again, you need to securely and reliably get that data to the cloud to be able to run analytics against that data. And while it's possible for uh, a customer to um, configure a secure connection from the cloud down to the sites uh, to collect the data, most customers are not interested in 
um, in that going through that um, that IT security effort, right? So the ability for our, for the historian for cloud to put a collector on prem, which is a a an encrypted outbound only connection to the cloud, it it dramatically simplifies the conversation with uh, with local IT security, right? There's no inbound port and everything's encrypted. So it's, you know, so there's no VPN connection that has to be set up. It's, you know, we've made, we've made the, the connection from the site secure and simple uh, with, uh, with the Historian for Cloud uh, upper application. You know, I think, and so we're sort of wrapping up here, right? So as we think about this solution around, you know, hybrid cloud-based OT data management, we allow customers to align with their existing IT cloud investments. You know, if you're if you're uh, an AWS customer, you're looking for ways to, to to consume AWS resources. You subscribe to this product in the AWS marketplace. You get to count a portion of your spend towards your AWS. Um, volume commitments, and the same thing will be true with Azure as we deploy on Azure in uh, after the first of the year. Yet it delivers this data foundation for operational um, optimization at the enterprise. Easily bring the data from all of your plants into a single uh, data store, allowing you to run your operations faster um, and, and deliver better outcomes uh, through optimization based on comparatives uh, across across the organization so with that i think uh you know that's that's sort of the message for today and happy to take any questions that we may have jeremy yeah steve actually one of the questions was kind of what you just talked about with aws if you are an aws customer and you're looking to use more resources how does that how does that look or how does that work out typically, you know, with it? Yeah, so great, great question. So we actually offer Historian for cloud for AWS in two, two licensing models. We have a traditional sort of term license model, which is going to most likely be used by, by existing Historian customers that have a perpetual license and they're looking to move off of their sort of on-prem hardware and move to the cloud. Um, you know, we can do some sort of a, it's easier for us to do a, a sort of trade of a perpetual license to a, a, a term-based license. Um, for customers that, for new, new applications, this consumption-based pricing is actually, but in both cases, you deploy the software through the marketplace. In the case of consumption-based pricing, it's actually built through the marketplace. So you don't, you, you know, you're, the, your usage of Historian will show up on your Amazon bill. So Amazon will bill you, all right, and then they count those dollars towards your Amazon volume commitment. Not, not one for one. Uh, it depends on the, on the contract. Most often it's something like uh, 50 cents on the dollar. So if you're spending a dollar with on Historian, you're getting 50 cents credit towards your volume purchase agreement. That's a general... Uh, that's a general statement. Each each customer's contract could be slightly different, but that's that's sort of generally the way it works. Do you help customers kind of figure out where they need to be in terms of consumption? Like, how can they conceive of that when they're when they're looking at a solution? Yeah, so I mean, we have some some simple tools that will allow you to model your consumption. So both on the data storage, and it, and and ultimately, and and so you'll see both the you know how many based on well, yeah, I've got. 10,000 tags, you know, at these sites that I want to store at once a second. I've got a whole bunch of, of data I want to store every 10 seconds. I've got data I want to store 100 milliseconds. I've got data, you know, whatever it is, right, you know, what, you can see what your what your consumption, what your annual or monthly uh, cost would be. And the same thing on the on the query side, you know, you know, you can you can look at, well, I've got I got 30 people who are going to run a dashboard that's going to update every every five minutes. And that dashboard's got, you know, so many data points on it. What's that going to cost? I've got, you know, engineers who are doing Excel queries. Um, you know, what's that going to, you know, at what frequency and how many tags and, and how many samples do they normally pull? So you got a little bit of you got to know a little bit about your use cases, but we give you we give you some tools 
Um, they're not published out on the web, but you know the gray matter folks have them, um, and and our folks have them. So we can we can certainly sit down with you and and help you understand what the uh, you know the what the consumption uh, cost would be. Steve, this, this last question is kind of for me, but just you know, looking at our audience today, it's diverse backgrounds. It's water. It's manufacturing. You know, it's it's energy. It's other spaces. Are there things, you know, in in historian in what we've talked about today, like features that specific industries you see really taking advantage of, or that really cater to, you know, a, a particular sector that just kind of would be interesting to call out. Um, you know, so the reality is, historian itself um, is, as I described, it's robust data collection. Right. So all of the store and forward capabilities that we've had in Historian, you know, whether it be the, the traditional on-prem version or the cloud-based version, the collectors mm -hmm. are the same. The only thing different that we've done here is we've added encryption. So as the data traverses the public Internet uh, to get to the cloud, it's all encrypted. Um, you know, the data storage is common. Um, it's the same Historian. Right. So, sure, different different customers use um, use historians differently. You know, the next thing that we're introducing into the into the Amazon marketplace is actually operations hub. So now, you know, in, in addition to having data storage and being able to use Power BI for dashboards or QuickSight, you'll have our um, visualization and application builder that'll let you build custom applications that are mobile ready um, for your different users. And so really, you know, in, in many ways, it's, it's um, you know, it's horizontal technology. Often the, the, the what we're connecting to is different. Aviation, for example, GE Aviation, they collect data off of machine tools. And so, you know, using MT Connect, right, they're getting, uh, they're getting different data and storing different data than than a water customer might be, which might again be, you know, energy and chemical consumption. It might be temperatures, um, you know, uh, different different data associated with, you know, that water treatment or the or the the sort of storage of water versus, a, you know, a, a process manufacturing plant. So the data, um, you know, all the same data types that have always been able to be stored in Historian, you know, can be brought up to the cloud and and then accessed. So it's um, yeah, there, I mean, there's just there are thousands of different use cases. Um, what we see is both from a cost of infrastructure perspective and for those customers that have multiple plants and they want to start doing comparatives across those plants. You know, this this is a very simple way for them to get going. And the nice thing with the consumption model, no upfront purchase and you basically can be up and running in an hour. You go to the you go to the marketplace, you basically subscribe, you know, you'll half an hour later historian will be up and running in your environment during that time period you've downloaded the this version of the collectors um, and you've installed a collector and and by the time the collectors are are installed you know historians up and you can be you know configuring the tags right so you know so instead of think about uh, I had to buy a server well 12 12 weeks later 13 weeks later you get started on your project now you can start with effectively no upfront cost, you can start in an hour. And so that to me is really important because, you know, the, the, the legacy pricing models of historians where it was cost prohibitive to, to use historian technology for small applications, all of that's gone. And so anybody that wants to get started today um, can get started today. Yeah, and that availability of servers, you're absolutely right. We're seeing that in the marketplace now. It can be tough to get them, you know, at all or quickly. And so this is another solution for that. Yeah. That can be implemented super quick. So Steve, thank you so much for uh, sharing all this with us, uh, us today and coming to us live from Las Vegas. It's really cool that you're at a AWS and um, kind of in the middle of it there and, yeah. and also able to talk to our audience uh, live. I, I just it's my pleasure. Thanks. Yeah. And, and thanks to the audience for joining. Uh, again, I hope, uh, I hope, I uh, hope this was interesting to you and, and, you know, whether you contact the gray matter folks or, or your GE folks, you know, we're, we're happy to have a dialogue with you about how you can uh, start to leverage this technology.
Yeah, absolutely. And if you visit us at graymattersystems.com, hit uh, start a project, we can start a conversation about anything that you heard in today's presentation and uh, dig into to what you're working on. And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, check out our training page and, and also check us out at Gray Matter under our events section where you can find more of events like this with Steve and, uh, and other folks from GE Digital. So again, Steve, thanks for joining us today. It was great. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. Take care.